Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today we've got a very, very special episode. We're going to be talking all about dissociative identity disorder. Brilliant. Well, well spoken, Tom. <clears throat> let's go. Let's go from the top again. <laughs> Good day and welcome back to the Forty Yorty Podcast with your host, Mister Thomas Henley. Of course, today we've got a very special episode for you. We're going to be talking all about dissociative identity disorder, or DID. Before we jump into the episode, I just want to point to the fact that. It's a, it's about March as a, as of this recording, and we hadn't had any snow in the UK um, over the winter period at all. Hardly anything. We had like a, probably like a, a light sprinkling, um, but the past week, past two weeks or so, the snow has just been absolutely crazy, and it's spring. And um, I was walking back from the gym earlier. I did some legs at the gym, which everybody. You know, who who goes to the gym will probably understand my pain. So the last thing that I really wanted to happen is walking back and um, having snow in my face for the entirety of the walk back. It's about a 20, 30 minute walk. Um, and when I got in, I was literally caked in snow. I usually wear all black, so it just made me look like a Dalmatian. But anyway, anyway, today I'm going to be interviewing No Tricks who has been a part of one of the previous episodes with the Neurodivergent crew, where we talked about different aspects of neurodiversity and creativity. Well, I feel like understanding the ideas is not something that I've had a lot of experience with. I haven't done a lot of research into it. It's not something that I particularly know a lot about. Um, and when we were doing our interview, I really wanted to ask a lot more questions about it because you know what I'm like, I find something new and I, you know, want to understand sort of a different perception and uh, way of being, different experiences. So with all that rambling done, how are you doing today, Nodrix? Hello, Thomas, and thank you so much for having me on your podcast again. Um I am very excited, but also a little bit um, not worried, but, you know, it's it's quite a responsibility for me Yes, uh, yeah. because um, with the condition that is uh, not exactly very rare, but at the same time, it's under diagnosed and uh, underrepresented in day to day life. Mm -hmm. um, I do have that responsibility for sharing um, the information about my case and um, explaining how it works. Uh, but at the same time, I'm running the risks of not being understood uh, the right way. So mm -hmm. um, it's a big responsibility and I'm looking forward to um, answering your questions today and uh, telling more about it. Uh, but yeah, well, I'm excited to do so. <laughs> I think so it's, thank uh, you so much for the chance. Sure. I think it's job. really important to, to highlight that, um, DID is, is probably, you know, just in my, ex in my experience of, um, looking into it, sort of going onto different Q and A sites and stuff, it seems to be one of the most stigmatized, um, conditions that I've ever come across. And, uh, you know, as, as, as we mentioned in the episode with the neurodivergent crew, I, you know, my, my understanding of sort of DID chiefly came from Hollywood movies. Um, I, I, I'd never come across any, um, actual people talking about, uh, their life, uh, with it, um, sort of sharing their experiences with it. So, you know, when when we got in, in touch, how long was it ago? A couple of months, a few months ago. Yeah, um, it was. I, I thought it would be really really useful to kind of have an episode where we talk about 
the sort of the specifics of it, some of the experiences, perhaps uh, some of the the differences or some of the the, the similarities with with other conditions uh, like like BP, BPD and PTSD, um, but also I guess talk about uh, where sort of people with with what experiences people with DID have sort of within the medical system. Because um, I imagine that. It's as with the stigma, stigmatizing of conditions in the public. I imagine that the medical system and um, different people within that also have very uh, controversial or differing opinions on on particular things about it. Um, and then I guess the, the last thing that I would want to cover is um, stuff about your music because. As uh, we mentioned, in the, I'm going to start saying the mention of the last podcast because um, it's going to get a bit um, annoying. But talking about your um, dark trap, your music, your music production, um, it's something that that I listen to pretty much on a daily basis. Um, it's it's something that not a lot of people would expect me to because I kind of come across as um, Perhaps, perhaps quite mainstream to most people, but I, I very much love my dark trap and my emo rap and my metal. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit on that, and then of course we'll sort of finish and, and talk about some of the the actual controversies and sort of address those. So that's that's the overview. <laughs> Don't know why I did that. <laughs> For any, for anybody out there, I I am I am having a bit of a strange day today. My brain is all over the place. Um, but us, usually I would sort of cancel the episode and then sort of reschedule and and do one again. But I feel like it would be um, best represented to everybody to to show me on my my highs and lows and my on point days and my not on point days. So we're gonna run with it. <laughs> so. After me monologuing for a while, would you be able to um, sort of explain to us what exactly dissociative identity disorder is and what kind of characteristics are sort of um, within that? Yeah. So um, dissociative identity disorder is basically when a person's mind can of uh, cope with uh, some traumatic experience and it creates a separate uh, identity in a separate part of the brain where it keeps uh, those memories and uh, impressions mm -hmm. separate from, from the, the host, from the um, core identity. Uh, my case is... Uh, luckily uh much simpler than it could have been um uh and i only have two identities mm -hmm. uh some people have so many that they wouldn't e even be able to count some sure. like i i've heard uh, of people about uh, with about a thousand mm -hmm. if not mm -hmm. more so there was i just want to say cuz you know, when we started chatting and chatting about it and sort of planning the podcast, I I did go onto YouTube and there, there seems to be quite a few. Well, I don't know how many, but there seems to be quite a few um, YouTubers with with um, DID sort of uh, talking about their experiences and sort of showing their their alters, like their their different identities, um, and it's you know I I. I don't know why I haven't ever come across that kind of stuff because it, it is under the neurodiversity umbrella, but it just doesn't, it just never seems to be something that, that kind of comes across my feed. Um, so meeting you sort of opened me up to these different YouTube channels, which, which sort of talk about, um, and so it is very interesting to sort of hear how they um, sort of manage life. Um, alongside sort of um, helping helping others understand because it, it's a very complex thing to, to explain to someone I imagine it's a very complex thing to understand too 
Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, how it happens is that because it, it's a protective function of the brain, separating those things, you're basically not expected to know that this happened to you. And uh, I only understood that. I the, the funny thing is that I always felt like that's the case. I really keep coming back to a drawing that I made uh, in my teenage years where I had, uh, uh, I had four personalities in that drawing. That's not confirmed. Uh, I only have two. Uh, but my teenage self was when I was, when I was there, uh, I was already exp- un- understanding that something must be different with mm-hmm. my brain than from, from a normal brain. Uh, and uh, I only finally understood what's going on. Um, it was almost two years ago now uh, when I was diagnosed the first time. Uh, and so the uh, doctor who was examining me, uh, she explained to me that that is legitimately the case that I have DID mm-hmm. and uh, that's the two different personalities. And then it was in retrospective analyzing everything that was going on. And as always, this is when it clicked and all started making sense. Before that, I couldn't even understand what's going on. And uh, there was uh, a year of complete and utter confusion where I couldn't understand what's going on with my life. And this is why when I started my music project and I started being um, a a public person, I Mm -hmm. realized that that's something I'm definitely not hiding. That's something that I'm sharing with the world because yet again, um, explaining and raising awareness might help other people to stop and think and try to go seek help and try to find out what's going on with them. Because Mm -hmm. ultimately it's all about the, um, the way of coping with it and the way of organizing your life to help yourself um, live with your condition. Mm -hmm. Uh, So without that um, counseling, I probably wouldn't have been able to sort out what's going on and um, I wouldn't have been able to build my life the way. I feel like there's, you know, there's some sort of parallels that I can draw. I mean, particularly when I was younger, obviously, you know, I'm autistic. I I don't have DID, but I did always feel like something was was kind of a bit different about me that was sort of, um, you know, like people would make sort of general statements about how people perceive and feel and think about certain things, which most of the people around me would, or most of the kids around me would sort of immediately understand and sort of um, identify with. And and for a lot of the time, so sort of during that kind of early childhood days, probably about seven, eight, nine, or ten years old, um, I did just just feel like something was off. And um, one one of the interesting things was uh, that that I, th- I think I've mentioned to you this before, but I used to think that I that I might have DID, and it was, you know. It was it was mostly a consequence of the fact that I didn't understand much about autism. Um, it was only until I came across the the concept of alexithymia, uh, sort of d- struggling to notice and categorize emotions within yourself, that I sort of retro- as you, as you said, sort of retrospectively looked back and kind of tried to understand what was going on. Um, and basically what I did when I was a teenager is I would split up myself into colors. So, you know, 
nowadays for your information it's the the colors were just different emotions um but for me because i can sort of identify with them and and put them into a box i felt that whenever i was feeling a different emotion that that was a different personality um because i was like oh i'm thinking different things i'm feeling differently in myself i'm thinking differently about other people i'm perceiving things a bit more differently <laughs> and i was like hey like that must be the case because no nobody's telling me like that this is a thing this is something that people experience and that the the funny thing is is that you know not many people do know about that sort of aspect of autism and it's it's very highly linked to autism having that experience with alexithymia it's very different to understanding other people's emotions there's different sort of things that come into play with that but for me that that was kind of as well as watching the, those hollywood movies that i was saying about um that 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 was kind of my sort of um dive into did sort of back then um i guess it, i mean because the, the, there's a specific part of the idea as a, as a diagnosis that I think some people might be able to relate to. Um, and that, that's the dissociative part. Because, um, you know, dissociation is kind of a natural defense mechanism for your, for your mm -hmm. psyche to cope with situations that um, you you didn't expect and they're just overwhelmingly negative or positive um, a lot of autistic people experience something called a shutdown which um, tends to come with a lot of heavy dissociation meltdowns do as well um, and a lot of people experience that feeling of dissociation particularly when they're drunk as well and um, mm -hmm. that sort of not feeling in touch with reality a little bit um, there's there's two specific aspects of dissociation. There's the um, I'm only speaking about it because I have them both. But <laughs> the, uh, one aspect of dissociation is the uh, derealization. So mm -hmm. that's that's the feeling like the world around you is fake, and you you don't feel you you feel like you could snap your fingers in a moment and just wake up out of a dream. It's it's that sort of crazy sort of lens that you have on the world um and then there's the aspect of depersonalization which is I, f I feel like it could be more applicable to to did um whereby you don't um identify with the person that you see in the mirror you know you might have experiences when you you have bad mental health um where you're struggling quite a lot, you you might feel it, be feeling a bit existential, and you sort of look at your your hands and you you see them moving, or you look at yourself in the mirror and you 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 watch yourself, and no matter how hard you try, you just can't sort of identify yourself with that, and it's a very it's a very like crazy feeling, um, and it, it used to bother me quite a lot when I was younger, uh, particularly when I got injured, like. If I if I got injured and something was like sticking in my skin or something, I felt sort of invaded almost. Um, sort of went off into a lot of dissociation. But um, I guess you know if you were to give some characteristics, I guess about DID, um, what would be what would be the best way of sort of explaining that those sort of aspects. Uh, those two that you mentioned are actually also part of uh, uh, most uh, lives of the people of with DID. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's it's known that DID people experience uh, depersonalization and derealization. Um, also, there is another aspect which is uh, even more interesting: is that. Uh, sometimes our other identities might uh, not be um, even separate from us as um, as in they don't have to switch 
they yes, yeah. might be present in our day-to-day life, right. uh, just passively influencing other behavior. And that's uh, um, that's my least favorite part of the duty. Uh, so but, so um, you, have the, you have the split and you have like um, the altars, like for in your case, two altars. And then sometimes um, you switch and one person is sort of in control of your body and is sort of aware and, you know, within your body. And then, but sometimes there's people, there's experiences where you're sort of going out on your your day-to-day and you have someone kind of, you feel like you have someone sort of influencing your choices and decisions and your thoughts. Yes. I've learned to uh, spot this behavior uh, over the last few months basically uh before that i couldn't even realize how much of my uh behavior is sometimes controlled uh but at the end of the day it does uh very much impact uh the quality of your life when you just sometimes can't uh exactly do what you want to do uh but yeah um so the particular case with DID is that uh, there is a separate identity that can not be uh, accessible f- for you. you. You cannot just control their actions. Sure. Uh, they are an absolute distinct um, other person. So... Um, at first, uh, when I was trying to reconcile the um, uh, my day to day life uh, as as me as a as this personality, uh, basically, so just to to go back into how it all uh, started and how it all developed, uh, we started um, like. The, the the separate identity uh, appeared in in my head uh, when I was a teenager uh, as a result of uh, a traumatic experience, uh, and all that time I wasn't aware that that's the case, uh, and we were randomly switching um, every now and then, uh, but I was the very uh, part of the very um, identity that was not convenient and was not welcome. Uh, I was the very identity that was created as um, a result of the traumatic experience. Um, why that was the case? It was because uh, our brain could not really cope with all the emotions. It was a teenage brain already overwhelmed with the world yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, and um uh there was too much to process and at the same time uh there was um our family that didn't really help um live through those emotions and didn't help um to actually process them uh Mm. instead so validating them and such. Yeah. Instead, we were told that um, all those, all that suffering and uh, depressive thoughts are for weak people. Hmm. Just let them go and and just forget them. And uh, that's where they all started piling up separately without being dealt with, mm-hmm. and they were kept separately of the day-to-day life and that that dump just started growing and growing and growing it never had any um way out it was just just there and it was not accessed and basically because uh that was kept in a separate place uh that place um just started being uncontrollable uh, and so that very identity uh, became dominant. So I I sometimes explain it that uh, people all do have different sides of, of themselves, right? Uh, 
uh, it's just that they can easily go back and forth and they, they don't have to separate them. They don't have to uh, suppress it. They can be uh, their good self, their bad self, their um, sad self, their, um, you know, excited self, like everything is fine. Yes, yeah. uh, whereas um, um, I was not uh, allowed to have that part of my life. So it, it was just separated from me. And eventually it just uh, started uh, being way too strong, way too... Uh, dominant and way to like just impossible to ignore mm -hmm. uh, and and you know it was just those times when uh, we felt safe to um, express ourselves we could switch from one to the other could be this one or that one uh, but with time what was also interested interesting is that um my normal other alter uh started becoming unhappy that there have to be switches and there have to be um times where she is not in control uh and because yet again she was so much more convenient to the society she was so much more welcome Uh, uh, by the people around her, mm -hmm. she started pushing me out. And uh, I'm, I'm the very one who was suppressed and had those darker thoughts and uh, yeah. is much less optimistic. Um, and um, uh, I found myself um, hiding and suppressed uh, for quite a while where I would be the one having passive influence and I would be the one not in control, uh, but just being on, on the sidelines of uh, everything that was going on in our head and what was going on in our life. Um, and uh, later, uh, at some point, there was another trigger So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how other people with DID work uh, with regards to that, but I'm mostly switching with triggers. There, there has to be something really particular for the full switch to happen. I think that's yet again because of uh, how um, dominant we are. We might be like a match like in, in the how powerful we are, I guess. So it's not very easy for her to push me out entirely It and and and, and switch. Vice versa. And now, yeah, vice versa, it also works the same way. So, um, but it's still pretty easy for her and for me to, to be um, exerting passive influence. And so um, after a bit of time, it was actually years and years of her uh, being dominant in this body. Um, another trigger happened and I was brought into existence. And that's where it was really uh, overwhelming because I wasn't in control for so such a long time. So hmm. I saw all this life in front of me that I just don't understand how to live. You didn't this identify is not my with... life. Yeah. Yes, this is not my to the you, to the you, very point as you were saying you, that like mm -hmm. as, as we were talking before that um like your ages are different as well and your 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 sort of physicality is different. Could you explain yes. like about that? Yeah, that's that's exactly how you said you feel like you're not in your own body. Uh, I actually just had the exact same <laughs> occurrence of people. Uh, uh, I was at the um, customs uh, with uh, a customs officer checking. Uh, I was flying in a plane and uh, a customs officer uh, was to check my passport. Mm -hmm. And right now my uh, I have two passports. Uh, one is, uh, with an embassy. That one was, uh, created like a year ago. Sure. And, uh, the other that I have is from, 
um, six or seven years ago. And if I use that one, the customs officers literally call help. Uh, they stare at me for, for ages. They, they start telling me this is not my passport. Uh, they start asking me questions. Uh, they, they start trying, trying to, to check how exactly is that my passport? They're asking for me for, for another ID. Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't even look like my other self. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, physically, uh, we are very different. Uh, I, well, from, from the research that I've seen and from what I know, uh, there might be real cases where, um, uh, the physical, like hormonal system, uh, works just very differently from uh, uh, from identity to identity. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's that's because everything is set in our brain, and a lot of things are controlled by our brain. And somehow, uh, as soon as I was, that was a, also a very interesting thing. Uh, the uh, our family uh, they started seeing changes in us, uh, pretty pretty drastic ones. Uh, they also couldn't understand what's going on. Uh, and, um, <laughs> some, some thought that, uh, we had a severe illness, mm -hmm. uh, up to the point where someone even asked me if I checked myself for, for cancer, uh, which I did, um, because, uh, I, I started losing weight drastically, uh, although, my other self is known to everyone to have been trying to lose weight for ages, whereas I just didn't do anything. It just started mm. just going down dramatically. Do you have like differences uh, in like the appetite hormones and yes, stuff? Yes, yeah. I I don't eat when I'm stressed. I I can't. I just can't force food in. Whereas she was eating loads when she was stressed. She couldn't stop. So this is this is how uh different things are and and so it was uh pretty surprising for uh for people to watch that um but uh eventually yeah so i was i was just faced uh with um trying to understand what's going on and why uh i don't feel like i'm living my life even though just days ago it was supposed to be my life so and not really like nothing really changed it was it was a trigger it was a, a uh just something that like not a traumatic experience per se but something that triggered uh something in in our mind uh and it was just a one off event after which everything changed so uh, drastically. So I was trying to figure that out and only uh, a year later. So I was trying to live her life for a whole year. Mm -hmm. um, and only a year later have I finally uh, realized that I need to go to therapy and to understand what's going on and that's when i got diagnosed and uh that's when it started becoming much clearer mm -hmm. as to what, what what those things were you mentioned you mentioned to me that like your other alter um they already had like a sort of like an established life at that time like um I guess well, you know what was what was the 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 process of like did you did you tell them all or did you like was it met with understanding was it you know how how did you sort of navigate that because I know, I know from talking to you that sort of your your interests and your your desires for life are sort of very 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 different um, so how did you how do you sort of manage that with other people around you, I guess. Uh, 
That was a very interesting thing because there was basically a year uh, mm -hmm. where nothing made sense to anyone, including mm -hmm. me. Sure. Uh, and to give you more uh, of uh, an understanding, so basically um, my other self is an investment banker. Wow. She... Uh, <laughs> Like a real one that worked on Wall Street, oh my like God. a top-notch one. Wow. Uh, she traded equities and yeah. uh, she was in love with her job. She is in love with her job. She uh, like so passionate that everyone knew her as the like the very star mm. of uh, of the the industry. Um, she had awards and everything like uh, she featured on the TV. So like to that point, uh, she had a family and she had uh, certain friends, hobbies and everything. She never listened to music. Uh, she never cared about uh, lots of things like mm -hmm. um, that, that I love. Uh, and the funniest thing of all is that how she, hated every like not not hated but she was like she was very very uh mm, scornful to all the creative people <laughs> uh yeah she sounds, sounds to be sort of more <laughs> i mean it's it, it's a very sort of logical kind of pragmatic thought based yeah ex sort yeah. of experience being you know, like an investment banker um whereas what what you furthest you, you can get from a creative person so and yeah. i i know <laughs> that she always had those jokes about creative people because she mm -hmm. knew that there inside her head lives another one that she doesn't want to let out sure. uh and there we are when 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 we switched it completely turned around because I don't understand a thing about finance. I literally don't. Uh, I <laughs> I don't I don't care about it. Mm -hmm. I uh, there is in my life like ever since I got these headphones, I'm just like in headphones all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I just can't. I I can't even imagine myself leaving the house without music on. And so. Um, from day one, I actually wrote my first song uh, on on the okay second day of uh, my um, taking over control, and ever since uh, I I installed my Ableton the um, uh, audio workstation where um, I create music mm -hmm. on day three of my taking over. And ever since I never closed it again, I wrote around I don't know at least. 60 or 70 tracks since then in in the three years and mm. uh i wasn't i didn't even know how to do that i just started learning and i couldn't stop and everyone was looking at me like what's going on with her she is uh skipping her job yeah. uh not working not not caring about um um all the people she kind of is supposed to care about like all her friends were not my friends. I couldn't, I, I had nothing to talk to them about. I even tried where, where uh, I, I had to meet some of them uh, because, you know, trying to mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. go on. And I couldn't find a thing I could talk to them about because everything I cared about, they didn't understand or they were talking about things that I couldn't care less about. Uh, so... I was did they, finding did it. Did they believe you? Did they, did they like, sort of, at least sort of acknowledge that that you were <gasps> you were different? Uh, they could feel that there was something different about me. Mm -hmm. They couldn't understand what was going on. Sure. And uh, I can say that I didn't disclose uh, my diagnosis uh, diagnosis with everyone. It's understandable. Uh, but 
but with the people that I knew could understand, it clicked. They, yeah. it helped them understand. And it was like, for, for some, it was an eye opener. Like, oh, that, that's what was going on. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, to talk, talking to you has definitely been an eye opener for me. I think it's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because you are sort of battling with, people's ideas of what what it is and sort of it's 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 very very different to a lot of other things like some people might be able to identify a bit with um generalized anxiety disorder you know sometimes they feel a bit panicked and stuff like that and then the same with depression sometimes people feel really apathetic and you know like that but um you know things like autism things like ADHD things like DID the the things that not that people don't really sort of understand or know about and you know even even for me it was I think when when we first started talking I wasn't I wasn't too like I didn't know enough about it and I wasn't like um if if I'm honest I I didn't really know how to sort of um understand it and and react and i i find it very hard to um identify things when i don't understand things um i have to be honest i think that's for the, for the majority of people but um it's it's definitely something that like talk, talking to you it's been um much easier to sort of understand and, and wrap my head around it um but I am coming from a place of being different to other people. So I sort mm -hmm. of get that sort of experience of, you know, perhaps, you know, life, life, life's not as simple and easy to understand as um, everyone would like it to be, or everyone thinks it is. Um, it's, it's actually a lot more sort of complex and there can be a lot of different people with different experiences of life. Um, so, so I kind of come from that a little bit, which I think helps, <laughs> but I, I have no, I have just no idea how, how, how you, you, you sort of navigated all of that, especially sort of being thrown into the deep end with a, you know, very intense job, um, a family, uh, a social network, like it must, it must feel just completely overwhelming <laughs> like I, I wouldn't know where yeah. to start like if that was to, to happen to me like it was well it was uh clear to people in my like in her work uh that um something was going on because my performance or her performance my performance uh has... did you go to the job did you go at all yeah, it? no, of course. It was a high paid <laughs> job. I could do nothing uh, with my music, yet I couldn't understand what's going on. The first year, the first year was very challenging. It was confusing as could be. Uh, and uh, I was literally given like, this is your life, live it. And I'm like, this is not my life. Hang on. It's just something is wrong. Uh, and I was figuring it out along the way. Uh, I was realizing that I didn't want to go home because mm -hmm. I was feeling that I am, I'm a stranger there in my mm -hmm. own home. Mm -hmm. for, for weeks or even months, I was trying to find all excuses I could not to go back home in the evenings and just to mm -hmm. go to sleep. Uh, I didn't care about my job so like her job i would just take my laptop with literally take my laptop to the trading floor open it up and with those headphones on i would be writing music yes i'm yeah. not joking it was it was crazy and so obviously everyone started understanding that something is wrong uh but everyone had their own explanation and again to some people i would never 
explain anything because they would never understand. Yeah, they just. Uh, but some some people some, you know that are just kind of the too close minded to sort of yeah, letting any just other to say possibilities. You're just mental. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not news either. Uh, but um, uh, the uh, uh, to some people it it explained everything and it helped them understand uh, mm. basically what's to come just as well because I started well after I had my diagnosis I realized that I don't have to live someone else's life anymore mm -hmm. uh, and I started uh, slowly unraveling everything to make sure that I don't burn all the bridges but uh, that I'm allowed to do what I want to do because she had a chance to live her life. Sure. I yeah. never had it. And so this is my time. Of, I, I do believe that that trigger that, that happened uh, in 2020, it was not, uh, it was there for a reason. It was probably just my chance to, um, to do what I am meant to do. And so, um, yeah, I, I just started unraveling, uh, her life to build my own one and uh my diagnosis helped explain to people that this is the reason this is why because obviously there were quite a lot of things that um like there were people who got hurt in the yeah. process uh because they were hoping that they lived with one person yeah. and then yeah. it turned to be another one. And so, um, yeah, so that helped, but, uh, it doesn't end there. Still a lot, uh, a lot to go through. Like, yeah. Uh, crazy. my family that was in the very beginning of the story that didn't want me to, um, go through my emotions uh yeah. i did eventually so what i did uh a year after i got my diagnosis i went to get checked again by another doctor mm -hmm. to confirm uh, yeah. yes uh i i chose the uh absolute um you know um a really really um uh like a specialist not exactly the specialist. I wanted someone who's uh, so educated that I could definitely trust them with the diagnosis, like uh, as in the oh, best I, education. I feel that the best. as well. Like I, I can't, ha I can't let anyone, anyone do any psychotherapy or counsel me if they don't like <laughs> know tons of stuff that I don't know. Like exactly, yeah. yeah. So I was going uh, via references from other people that I know, but I still I wanted like the. The, the most highly skilled uh, professional. Uh, so, uh, and I got it confirmed. And that's when I told my family that this is the case. And that was the funniest moment ever because there was absolute denial and uh, it was even funnier. Uh, I was given another specialist with uh some no medical education right but uh some sort of holistic astrological oh, approach lovely right? great that's just what you want some naturopathic medicine we, just to we we had <laughs> such a good time together me and her uh it was just amazing because i was by by that time i've already had i've already read uh a lot of uh specialized medical literature and, mm -hmm. and research yeah. about my case uh and i was just what did she say facts. did you say that like like oh you must be a gemini like <laughs> she felt my energy oh she, she felt your energy she, yeah she didn't even she got have the tingles to, she, she didn't even ask <laughs> questions she, she actually called me and said like uh, you know she put, you, put um, her hands over your head and like no it wasn't it, even huh? A video call. I was hoping at least for a video call. She just called me and she said that. Uh, oh, so the, she didn't even see you like in person, and she felt she your energy. Said, 
<laughs> she said that by the energy that she hears in my voice, yeah. she can say that I am fine. Good day, viewers and listeners. Apologies for my very rude interruption to our regularly scheduled broadcast. I just want to remind you that if you have enjoyed the podcast thus far, please make sure to rate, subscribe, like, comment, and share. All of these actions are pretty much the lifeblood of a small, independent creator like myself, and it will help me get most of my work, more of my work, to people who really need it. If you want to stay up to date with my life, get behind the scenes content, check out my daily blogs, head over to the Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. You'll find a link to that down in the description, alongside my range of neurodiversity clothing, just like this strong, powerful artistic hoodie that I love so much. And my website, of course, where you can find a contact email to book me for one to one autism coaching, interviews, workplace training, and speaking. So, Thank you very much for listening to this very annoying self-advert, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> I don't have any issues. Wow. Uh, and, oh, it, yeah, because uh, another diagnosis that I gave uh, to, to my family was that I actually, I at that point in time, that was uh, what, uh, a few months ago, like, five or six months ago, I had depression, like right. again, mm -hmm. diagnosed. Uh, and is this, this something that, that only you experience or is it kind of? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the funny part. Uh, uh, different alters can have different, uh, again, hmm. sorts of, um, well, you've got all the bad, all the, the negative experiences. Yes. And so I am I am prone to depression, uh, and uh, and I knew that uh, before because uh, before she started controlling this body, I had depressions back then. But then my family also uh, absolutely disregarded that and said like, no, you don't have depression. So uh, um, yeah, so I was diagnosed with depression too. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I passed that on, uh, and, um, yeah, so that holistic, um, specialist said that, no, <laughs> you don't have depression. I can feel, you don't have depression you're a strong either. woman. You're a wow. strong woman. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and that's when I actually realized that everything everything is coming exactly from there maybe if things were different maybe if i was diagnosed with depression if i had a proper uh specialist uh um counsel me back then in my teenage years an actual licensed professional yeah i i might have not had this condition mm. at all which well, um, is why raising awareness is so important and hmm. why uh, it like everyone should know um, what to look out for and what to um, try to go to and seek help with for so well um I know we've, we've, we've talked a lot about sort of um, sort of when it when it came on and um sort of the the experiences with uh your family and um the social networks and things like that but what about like the medical system because I, I know you talked about the holistic natu naturopathic um, medicine person but like for you were, were there any roadblocks or were there any difficulties within sort of going for that diagnosis um or or is it is there some things that you could talk about that other people might experience? Like, um... well, I was super nervous when I was uh, confiding in uh, to the people that fi found me the specialist, like the, the second uh, doctor, because um, they those people were also in the in the uh, psychiatric and psych. Psychologist, 
psychologist uh, industry. So uh, I was not sure if I should or shouldn't uh, confide in them because I, I didn't know how exactly they would uh, see that. But in instead, they were very understanding and, and found me the, the very uh, doctor who, who also... Um, I wouldn't say that she specializes in it, but uh, it was part of her uh, medical education, which I was very happy to to know. Um, so that is um, certainly something of a relief, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I, pro- I might have been lucky to. Um, never come across anyone who wouldn't would, would be um, doubtful of of my condition. But yeah, so that that holistic um, specialist was was <laughs> the the only thing. Yeah. Well, um, I, I guess another aspect of that is sort of <laughs> misdiagnosis because or, or sort of similarities and differences with other sort of conditions because um you mentioned that there was specific trigger triggers or specific traumas that kind of um started um yeah. or made the split trying just trying to think about the terminology that i'm using so i don't want to i have a tendency whether i'm talking about something that i don't know a lot to use very sort of immature childish language like how did that kick off for you like oh, uh-huh. just a no bit. actually um that's that's a, a very interesting question so basically as my doctor explained to me there uh have to be three uh different sets of factors aligned together uh for uh, a dad mind for, for a mind to split mm-hmm. uh basically those are sociological so sociological yeah, correct sociological. me if I'm wrong, please this is this is not my native language if someone hasn't understood that yet <laughs> so um sociological then uh psychological and physiological mm-hmm. yes, uh and yeah. so all stars align together and there we go uh the mind split so uh sociological is exactly the trauma the traumatic yeah. experience yeah. Uh, it it triggers it and um and what would that be classified uh, as as sort of PTSD um i wasn't diagnosed with PTSD and i don't think i have it uh i it i think those things don't haunt me so sure. i i think um um so th- there was a trauma, but it's not like um, specifically yeah, like the the consequences of that trauma are different than. Yeah, I I wouldn't say yeah. so. So basically, I think my mind coped with it by doing yeah. so. So I did um, live through it, but mm. in a in a very particular way, which sure. is my condition. Um, uh, so. Sociological is the very trigger, I guess. Uh, then there is uh, uh, psychological, is uh, the way I guess uh, the mind responds to certain triggers. Um, as I was uh, also told, is that for me um, that is BPD. So I yeah. was already, yeah. Yeah. I already had BPD. Uh, a lot of people who have DID also have borderline personality disorder. A lot of them, not everyone, but a lot of them. But the reverse isn't true. So that's, that's kind of ca- characterized as like having um, a swings in emotions. Very, very yes. intense swings yes. of emotions. Very, so like, very, very emotional people. Like, th- th- things are more impactful negatively mm-hmm. on you. Um, yes. Your emotions and your expressions are very intense. Because um, I, I, I think, um, isn't, it, isn't it also that, that BPD has some um, influence on like relationships and stuff, like how you relate to other people yep. um like thing, things within that relationship can sort of become 
bigger than it would with most. Exactly. Yeah. It's just very, very, very enhanced uh, emotional turbulence uh, within one's brain. But um, yeah, so basically I was already BPD. Uh, it, it's it's something hereditary. It's something that runs in our family. Uh, and uh, I already had that. And, and so basically when the traumatic experience happened, uh, it, it created a way much more of a turbulence in my brain, uh, sure. but also because of not being able to cope with that. Again, that was yeah uh, how it happened, and also um, physiological. Well, I don't really know. I didn't uh, go too far into that, but apparently that there were some must have been some factors that um, have um, impacted it in a certain way. So. Yeah, all those factors together um, would have um, made me more uh, prone to getting DID than sure. some other people. I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I I I think there's there's another parallel that I could possibly make. Um, me trying to to chip in my takes, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, as you were talking about, sort of, you know being or, or having bpd made you sort of more more sensitive to those events um i was kind of thinking of uh, the podcast that i did with megan neff from uh, neurodivergent insights because uh, we were chatting about uh, ptsd and cptsd and um she was she was mentioning that there's there's certain aspects of of ptsd that uh, are not always present in autistic people, specifically um, significantly traumatic events. Um, and like we were talking about the difference between PTSD and CPTSD is the CPTSD sort of being a diffuse sort of over a long time kind of trauma. Like, um, and and for, for autistic people, because we're, we're all... You know, we tend to be a lot more sensitive to our environment and feelings and not really have a good grasp on the social landscape and things like that. Um, that we, we can take things a lot more intensely into us. So smaller traumatic things can have bigger traumatic impacts on us. Um, so would you, would you say that that's kind of like a similar sort of sort of comparison to make like yeah sound sounds right good be. i'm just trying <laughs> i'm trying to because I, I as i said for myself it's 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 important for me to understand um things <laughs> uh, you can you can tell that my brain's a bit funky today <laughs> I guess another really interesting part um, is sort of about how uh, DID sort of inter interplays with the music that you create. Um, as I said before, that I very much like the whole dark trap stuff, the emo rap, the the metal, uh, the dark side of life, dark side of music. Um, I guess what I want to know is is what why has or how has um, DID sort of um, in, inspired your your music? I know that for, for you yourself, you know your other alter was sort of very logical and pragmatic, and like um, sort of went for those sort of more step by step process based things, whereas yourself you are more sort of creative. Um, but do you, do you think there's any aspects to your experience of life that have influenced the way that you make music or the, the genres and, and things like that? Totally and entirely. Um, the very interesting thing is that, um, as I mentioned, I created like an insane number of songs over the past uh, couple of years 
uh, and I keep on creating stuff without even thinking. It's just like it's just bursting out of me. Uh, and people who who know me and and like my fellow artists and uh, people who understand what I do, they are all surprised at how this keeps on going and I just can't stop and ju I just create thing after thing after thing after, after thing. That's because all those things, all those dark things um, were stored in this container that I am mm -hmm. for so long without any sort of release that all of that material is now being processed I sometimes go back in time and I process things that I wasn't able to because it was just retrospectively. Dumped. Yes, it was just dumped into this container without any release. And so it's now getting that, uh, is, I'm now letting that out. And so it's just that it is just amazing to see how that, that process goes. It's just, it's just endless. It's just, just going and going and going. Um, and so it's not just music, is it? Because you, you you do a lot of stuff in terms of visuals. Yeah, that's, and... that's lots of visuals. They're just there in my head. I just I just I just let them out. That that's all I do. Uh, but uh, it's um, uh, the the interesting part here is that uh, which is also very very um, um, explains a lot is that uh, since I started. I had multiple goals at uh, trying to create something positive. Yeah. Um, there are definitely things uh, like positive uh, things that I like in, in music and in, mm -hmm. in art, but whenever I try them, they just don't work e to the point where I like even funk is one of the like little subgenres of I what I funk. do. Yeah. Everyone does. It's it's very <laughs> bouncy and it's funky and it's just, and it's, it's fun. It's just the the beat for me. It's like just the the perfect sort of bassy kind of tone. I don't I don't know how to describe it, but there's certain like bass um, bass aspects of songs that just hit right, and then there's other ones that just don't at all. Um, and I I tend to find them more often in like funk music and stuff like that. Well, I cannot do that. <laughs> no. It's way why not, too why not? I I try. It's just it's it's way too positive for me. It's just it's like literally mm. um okay. I'm I'm actually releasing one funk track very soon. It's not produced by me. It's like the very like rare track that is not produced by me, but is produced mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. uh, another person, but uh I am the vocalist there. But but then uh, I was once asked uh, uh, by a friend uh, to just write the song again for someone else's production, but uh, write a song and write some lyrics uh, and and sing uh, on a track that was um, it was just you know just beautiful track. Uh, and they asked me, "Can you please make sure that no one dies in there?" I'm like, "Wait a second, <laughs> what? No one dies in there? Are you serious?" How can I do that? And I couldn't. I did eventually write a song. It was called Acceptance. Uh, it was about accepting someone's departure. So they didn't die in the song. They did before. Yes. So <laughs> someone is, is I, just... I, I identify so much with that. It's like, I, I mean, obviously my, my writing, you know, I talk about I try to end things on a very positive note, but um, I feel I feel like 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 yourself, you know. I've you know I had some difficult experiences throughout my life that were, were, were from different areas of life and also different different times. I'm I'm I struggle to think about it, but um, I I have I've always just gravitated towards all of the negative emotions like i'm i'm a massive just goth in my heart like i just i love the melancholic it's like i i find the the beauty in the negative experiences in life um which 
it's 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 also it's also my downfall as well because it means that my brain's always wired to to be focused on the the problems and the negative things it's like someone comes up to me and shares positive news with me about themselves i'm not really sure how to how to process that and react to it uh, but if someone comes up to me and, and shares some negative news i i am just immediately just enthralled with just feeling that and and what that person's saying to me um it, it goes so far like especially like when i when i used to do my my depressing poetry when i was when i was a bit younger that was definitely the case um and even even goes so far as the the first sort of youtube videos that i made though they were always about um difficult things and i think you know because because people don't really want to you no know, for, for me my ideal is to express um the 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 darkness and the pain and the negative experiences to their to their fullest but um i found that sort of over over the years of you know trying testing things out that uh, not many people do want to, to to hear the 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 reality of how hard life can be um and i think whenever i play play my my play dark trap music or my email rap it's kind of like a space that i can have that's outside all of all of sort of the i was gonna say like the mainstream world um so uh, as i said I, I mean i'm quite sort of outwardly positive um but that's that's only because i I like to 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 be a positive thing for other people and not necessarily because I feel positive. So it's kind of like I'm I'm happy that other people are not experiencing what I've experienced. Um and I have that sort of space in my mind where I you know I enjoy the watching combat sports and doing combat sports and listening to to dark music and um you know having all sorts of gothic items and um jewelry and clothes around my room but it's 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 always just such in contrast to um how i present that it kind of i think it catches a lot of people off guard especially if they've sort of seen me about and haven't talked to me um you know i come across as quite sort of <laughs> I don't know how I come across, but I've I've been told that I come across quite sort of dismissive and um perhaps a little bit grumpy. Um but then as soon as they, as soon as they actually talk to me it's 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 obviously different. But um so I so I I, I, I do I empathize a lot with that feeling of just wanting to express the the negative things because we're, we're not living in a society as much as we would like to say that um wants people to talk about things in a completely raw way like that everything's filtered everything's all the words are, are cut out um if you want to make stuff for people online um about negative things that the algorithm is going to sho shove them back into a corner only perhaps a few people will see it and then it kind of goes back you know and and you realize that it just doesn't do as well so i think you know having spaces for creativity like as you said for for your music and and the graphics and things like that that's it can be a really important outlet for a lot of people um especially when you've 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 been sort of you yourself sort of been sitting with that for for, for years and years and, and having to just absorb all of it um it must feel somewhat liberating to be able to um have control over your life and and have that that outlet well the the other thing that uh my condition or actually conditions uh um impact uh in my artistic choices is uh well, with uh, 
BPD because I experience emotions differently and in a much uh, enhanced way. Uh, sure. That's basically why uh, emo rap is uh, something that uh, drew uh, me um, as an artist. Um, like that, that, that um, made me so um, involved in it. And um, it's crazy, isn't uh, it? The first time that you hear something like that and they just, they're like, they're rapping about it and they're making a music song and they're just, it was, it was like the first time that I actually felt validated by the music that I was hearing. Like, um, I, it just, just, you know, that, that feeling that people get where they just feel the music and it's like, oh, this represents me. I was like, I got that with, with emo rap. <laughs> like, I was just like, this is just so me. And then I'd show it to other people and, and let them listen to it. And they'd just be like, oh, that's just a bit, that's a bit too out there. Like, it's, <laughs> you know, they just no, can't to, relate to it. To me, it was in, in reverse. I was just looking for how exactly I can express my feelings the best mm -hmm. way yeah. for them to be heard and for them to sound right and, uh, you know, coherent. Uh, so this is, this is why uh, I, I went in that direction. Um, and apart from that, well, my mask is also the, um, my condition um, that, um, has me do that because uh, I need to protect my identity at all costs because I never know when the switch might happen again sure. and when the full switch might happen again and when I might have to um, give up control again for her. And uh, she doesn't, like outspokenly doesn't want me to... She actually is against my whole music career altogether. Sure. Uh, to her, it's not worth our time. Uh, but uh, at least she can have that, as in we kind of agreed that uh, if she ever comes back, she will want to reinstall her past life and for that sure. to to happen she might be she needs to be able to hide um what's happening mm -hmm. with you me have right to sort now of have to have the um you have to have the mask to sort of protect their image because i imagine that if they're an investment banker and they sort of you know like I, f I feel like that there's such contrasting worlds in terms of employment that I feel like it could impact sort of their, their career pr prospects with that maybe. That's also why I can't have tattoos, for instance. That's, that's very funny because like uh, it's, it's also her passive influence has been so strong. Like I was so many times since I've taken over control, I was – wanting to just go there and do yeah. it but again yeah. before i had my diagnosis i couldn't understand what's going on and i couldn't understand that there's something someone in my head just talking to me like just no 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 you're not doing this so and i was like why people asked me like oh why don't you why don't you go to get tattooed and i'm like i don't know i don't know something is stopping me like literally something inside is stopping me and I want to. This is my thing. It's like I love it, mm -hmm. and I can't. So <laughs> this is is just yeah. I I, I just can't do it <laughs> because that's really it's interesting. It's not only my body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Well, um, I think it it would be good to kind of um, wrap things up. I mean, it's it's been amazing to sort of hear your your story um i don't have many podcasts where i'm where i'm this quiet so uh I'd, you can take that as a good thing um <laughs> it's um i really appreciate um how open you've been um i i guess the you know the last things that i really want to touch on is because 
you know, I mentioned at the start that DID is probably one of the most stigmatized disorders out there uh, and conditions out there. Um, so I think it would be really useful to talk about the controversies um, because I, I, I did I did some research into into it and um, what, I, what I really found to be quite illuminating for me was that um, there's a specific way that diagnosticians within like the psych psychology field um, sort of create diagnoses um, and and the way that they do that and the way that they um, can create these criteria, um, they, ha they have to be solid enough and picked up enough um, in enough people to be considered to be um, diagnosable. Like so with major, major depressive disorder or, or clinical depression, um, you know, uh, they, they should be able to pick up a certain percentage of people as faking it or pick up a certain percentage of people who actually have the condition. Um, and if, if they can't, then it can't really be a thing that they regularly diagnose. And it was really, really interesting looking at those sort of percentages because those um, diagnosticians, those psychologists who uh, diagnosed uh, DID in individuals actually showed that um, they were more successful in diagnosing correctly with DID than with major depressive disorder, which is just absolutely insane uh, because it just pr pretty much just spits in the face of people saying that it's not real um, because you now just thinking about it, I mean, a lot of the psychological, or if not all of the psychological based disorders are, or conditions, they are um, subjective. They, they, there is always a wall between one person and the diagnostician. There's always a person who can e experience things and, and explain it in a different way or choose to omit certain things or choose to over-exaggerate certain things. And so just knowing that along with the fact that that sort of diagnostic rate is just a lot more successful for DID, I feel like that that was a real sort of solidifier in me sort of, um, you know, when I, when I was sort of researching around it and such. Um, so, so probably the best question is, is DID real? And I know I, I obviously know what the answer is, but um <laughs> Well, um as far as I understand from research, I, I won't won't use my my particular example there just because uh, sure. you can listen back to what has been said today and mm -hmm. you can uh, take your own decision whether that sounded real or not. Uh, but as for the things that I read and as for the things that are out there in the public domain as, as mm -hmm. uh, for the research and uh, all the works that um, have been um, done by uh, the scientific community, uh, it it's more than real <laughs> like there is so much uh i i think because of how stigmatized it is and because of how many uh um people are actually putting it um in doubt mm -hmm. um because there there certainly are such in the scientific community too yeah, uh, yeah. i think it already proves that it exists that no one has been able to um, disprove it just sure. yet because there have been lots of attempts. But yeah, uh, because of that, also there's uh, additional scrutiny and there is even more uh, research done just to make sure that mm -hmm. uh, all those um, claims of it not being real are uh, met and and, you know, Preventive, you know, like because as, as you said, sort of 
you having the the physical differences, the the hormonal differences uh, around like um, your weight, um, as well as the things that you gravitate towards in life uh, being so different. I think, um, you know, there, there. I think if I'm right, there are there are people who have particular things that could just particular aspects of their alters personalities or their likes or their skills that just couldn't be recli- like replicable in in any circumstance like they they're, they're always like this and they always have these these skills and like they have like IQ differences and they have like different postures and have different like speaking patterns and such it's just it's it's I know, uh, you know, obviously that 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 I feel like is enough for, for for me, and obviously talking to you and understanding it, it's you know, it's it's enough for me. Oh, th- um, there's also the factor that that uh, with technology where it is right now, brains can be scanned, and so yes, as as uh, as as far as I could uh, read, is that um, some people have alters that are different in age and up to the point where there are kids living in their brains yeah and you can easily track uh, a child's behavior and the child's brain mm-hmm, mm-hmm. behavior uh, as opposed to a grown up grown-ups one and so it was also researched so people who have uh, child alters uh, have been scanned, their brains have been scanned while they were um, having those alters in, in uh, control and uh, they did have different uh, mm-hmm. brain waves or like different behavior of the of the brain it's for at different that time. things lighting so, up for different cues yeah. and yeah it's really interesting. Um, I think um, there, was, there was a point that I was going to make that completely forgotten. Um, what was I going to say? There's always there's always some one part in in it, within the episode that my brain just flumps. <laughs> when I was when I was looking up other other stuff around DID, um, there was a video of this. Um, case of a criminal um, who, you know, they, they they weren't sure whether whether it was was genuine or not, but they um, basically leaned on a DID diagnosis in order to avoid serving jail time. Um, like uh, I can't I can't remember the exact specifics of it, um, but they. They, they they were inconsistent, like like we were talking about how, you know, the the changes and the alters were very consistent for a certain personality or behavior or brain pattern or, or hormone or look or things like that, and and he wasn't very con- like consistent with that, and um, there were there were a lot of things that are across sort of because he was institutionalized instead of sent to prison. Um, and there were a lot of cases along that sort of journey where there was just, you know, he, he said that one of his alters could speak like Spanish or something and, and, and he, he couldn't. Um, and they couldn't write that. And I think th- things like that, specifically in the media, can can be um, in, in like the real life media. I think it can be quite um Damaging. stigmatizing in nature like uh cuz obviously like people people can fake anything like if they if they want to and they know the um ins and outs of it and they've practiced it <laughs> you know if someone could someone could fake autism if they, if they really wanted to i i can imagine um not saying that that anyone else does um <laughs> would want to um 
but it's it's something that people can do and it's it's that that existence of people having that sort of um confirmation bias about things because they're kind of seeing people or they they see someone in the news who has like a like a child altar and they're like what that, that doesn't make any sense to me this is this must be fiction this is like unbelievable what 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 is this like it must be wrong and and so they just ignore all of the the information that just confirms that it is a thing um and wait for something just to happen like someone having a child alter or someone going to jail uh or someone faking DID in order to avoid jail time um like pe- people very much have like the for, for some things that they don't understand it's almost like they're, they're clinging on to um something in order to to not agree that it is a possibility because it just it's so far out of their um field of view of like how reality can be for them yep um i i, I guess like you know because it, it is stigmatized in in the media and as you said within the scientific community which is a really really big issue um but what about sort of mainstream film what about the um films like split um what do you think about that kind of representation do you feel like it's it's accurate do you feel like it's good (laughs) or bad i think uh yeah a, a lot of did people have issues with split I can't say that uh, I am on their side because, um, to me, it it depends on how the what, what conclusions people take from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, people do take the very very uh, wrong conclusions, uh, but that's what saying that the people light can do dangerous. in every. Yeah, can have well, evil people can do people. that from any sort of sort of thing. Uh, what I kind of saw in a Split is that it actually shows you that there is so many different ways uh, that a DID person might be like. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I I I keep coming back to to this example of of just a household with uh with people in it. How many sorts of like how many combinations of people living in one house could there be? Millions. Uh, there could be evil people in that house. There could be absolute angels in that house. Like, and all of them might might be saints and everything in so, between. Yeah, and everything in between exactly, and so. Uh, if people didn't get that from Split, then, well, I'm not sure what <laughs> can help there. But uh, I did like it for uh, explaining, again, that um, DAD people might be uh, very different from others and, and uh, the, the uh, alters can be so uh, dramatically um different from each other and that um is is just a pretty unique condition in that way so Mm -hmm. they did they did really point that out there but uh yet again if people think that that's exactly how every did system should be like then well cool i'm I'm gonna go and find some superpowers in me (laughs) uh, because i i i i found it very hard to to grasp that you only had have two alters because in my in my mind when I think of DID I think of people like within the film of like split they have like 10 12 like 20 different sort of people living in it and there's just constant switches back and forth throughout the day and that's that's how I sort of pictured it in my mind when I was sort of trying to understand it um just two people in this house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't invite anyone over. No, actually, uh, I know that uh, some DAD people develop more uh, um, personalities with time. I'm not sure if that, that's because of like uh, 
um, continued exposure to traumatic experiences or not, or is just brain just continuing to develop uh, in that uh, path with us is just stop there and uh, mm -hmm. i guess maybe maybe the problem was solved like as in uh the yeah the case was solved we the, the this this container was created everything fit there nothing else was needed and so it, it just stopped there i i hope that that will still be the case forever because that's actually manageable <laughs> yeah there's um I mean, there's just one last thing that I want to touch on before we sort of try and wrap things up. Um, I uh, I follow a lot of like varied, like uh, uh, different YouTubers. Like I like to, personally, I like to watch people from all sort of angles, like uh, of life, whether that be politics, whether that be sort of opinions, whether that be, you know, disciplines and personalities. I I tend to follow like a lot of different people, and th there was this one particular um, YouTube channel who, which which was talking about um, sort of well it it, it we weren't really sh sh obviously they weren't very sure because they're not, they're not an expert in in the idea they have no personal experience um, but they were talking about how um, people were faking it on social media for attention. Um, I, uh, you know, obviously just was pretty taken back by some of the, the things that they were saying, but I, do you think that, that some people could do that? And do you think that if, even if that's the case that, well, I'm, I'm kind of doing a loaded question, but even if that's the case that some people do fake it and, so, and other people don't, that it's worthwhile for you to comment on them and say that they are faking something. <laughs> Very loaded question because obviously you can tell what my my opinion is. But um, yeah, what, what what do you think about that? Like, uh, do you do you find that that's something that that anyone's mentioned to you before? That's funny because it was just the other day when I was uh, discussing someone with someone, mm -hmm. and I was expressing that the that person is someone I really don't trust, and I would really, um, I would be very disappointed if I found out that they're actually faking it because it's a it would be a huge blow, but. Um, it's just ugly and I'd rather people didn't do it because it's just ugly. It's just like, well, you know, again, um, there are people like faking cancer. There are people faking, uh, that they're cripples. Like mm. <laughs> there are so many ugly things in the world. Uh, unfortunately, that won't make people um, st stop believing that sure. cancer exists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that won't make people doubt that uh, cripples exist. But with DID uh, being as um, uh, under-researched as it is uh, and under-discovered as it is, uh, it obviously will... Um, be damaging to mm. those who are trying to get diagnosed and trying to um, find their place in the society uh, with how they are. Uh, so, yeah, I uh, if I discovered that someone big were faking it, I it would be a very very big ethical dilemma <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh yeah i just i really don't want to think about it because it's no, just no, ugly. Of course, it's, yeah. it's just ugly and it's uh mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm 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 mentioning this because i feel like there's a lot of people out there who are very quick to give their opinion on something 
and um, they see something that doesn't necessarily align with their view of what's possible and what can happen, and they think it's their responsibility to point it out. Um, and I think I think in in any case, if someone is, you know, you know, I, I was watching another person, sort of a, a doctor in psychology, and that he was talking about. You know, the facts that actually coming out and displaying yourself to the world as as your alters and sort of letting people know is like one of the first steps in um you know processing what's what's happening to you and sort of managing your life and sort of finding ways to um to grow and to to you know live life. Um and 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 the fact that that people do that kind of thing i think is it's i think it's 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 not something that that people should should do they shouldn't be pointing out um people even even if they they are very strongly inclined and they feel like um this is something that they should talk about and that it's something that they feel is wrong and they feel like they're faking it for attention you know you you've got to think of the type of people who would fake that kind of thing they're probably not very mentally okay like they're probably not doing very well um on one hand you could be really sort of denying the reality of someone with a very complex and stigmatized condition and on the other hand um you are bashing someone who is in a very vulnerable um and sort of delusional state um and that's not really something that I think people on the internet should should have um, a say in. Really, uh, I think you know, in, in as many cases as possible, you should always take people's word for it. And I think you know, just just as we're, I was talking about the sort of the diagnosis success for for major depressive disorder and diagnosis for for DID. People fake depression, um, especially during in in work situations, um, family situations, um, in legal situations, either with organisations. If they say that they're depressed, they're automatically a, a vulnerable group. Um, so it's kind of, you know, you you could take that any anywhere, and you could you could go about and say, hey, you don't exist because you're depressed. Um, so I I feel like it's 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 hard for me because it is like it's it's a very stigmatized area of things and it's not something that's as researched as things like major depressive disorder but i don't feel like just because it's something that doesn't seem um congruent with your worldview that you should immediately pointing out as something as as being fake or unreal or not valid like it re- it really annoys me. It really angers me when when people just feel that need to be like, "Hey, no, not real." <laughs> it's like, great. Do you want do you want to write a thesis about it and and post it? Do you want to um, give them a diagnosis by by talking through like their their life and their experiences and stuff? It's 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 ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm thankful that I don't get a lot of people saying that that my being me being autistic is fake. Um, <laughs> now, now and again, people wait. Wait, realize, you don't but... look autistic. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> well, yes, yes, you know, there's, there's no look to it. No. <laughs> uh, it could be anyone. I, you know, I could be, could be faking everything. I mean, that's just as valid as as any point about the ID. I think in my books. But anyway. Um, I just wanted to get that off my chest because it is like it's something that I've been thinking about and and sort of thinking about how in general people react to things like that and you know if there's a lot of people who think that autism doesn't exist and I think if you're listening to to us talk uh, you're hearing about no tricks experiences and you're thinking hey that sounds a bit too far fetched. Uh, think of all the people in your life who don't think that autism is a thing and think how that made you feel. And, you know, I think think that's 
that's a good comparison to make. That's that's you could very well be doing um, a lot of personal uh, emotional damage to a lot of people by um, being that sort of close minded about stuff. Um, but yeah, um, was there was there anything else that you wanted to to say on that or? Um, yeah, I think if people listened to this point in the podcast, I think well, they, they, they probably will be have because very. In order to listen to it, they need to they need to be at this point in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. They probably have uh, little doubt remaining uh, yes. about how I real hope. that is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think we have done a good job explaining <laughs> you've done a great job i uh, i really you. you know appreciate how open you are and, and and also considering the time difference it's it's very late for you and um i know that you're probably itching to to get into bed and sort of wind <laughs> down and stuff so i appreciate you coming on at such a such a late time it's it's usually for me it's usually the opposite because i'm you know, interviewing someone perhaps in like the US. So I'm like interviewing them at like midnight and stuff. So yeah. I know how it can feel. Um, but I really appreciate it. So thank you. I guess, you know, where can where can people find you? Where what can um what's what's your like uh, preferred landing page for people to go to? Well, Instagram is number one, but mm-hmm. otherwise I'm trying to be active and on as many platforms as I can. And I'm no tricks with a zero and double X on yeah. each one. Cool. And I will put that down in the description as per usual. I realized that going over my past couple episodes that I forgot completely about song of the day, like the past two episodes that I've done, I just haven't talked about that at all. And I haven't even asked you what you would like to be your your song of the day today. Um, I'm th- there was a song just to just to make an, an offer that I found to be quite insightful and impact impactful. Um, the one about you, your conversation with your alter. Uh, what was the name of that? Uh, there are two songs that I uh, made about DID, about my case. Uh, one is Dreadful Future. Is it just about how it feels? Because I wrote it straight after having a huge storm in my head and a very rough conversation there with, with her. Um, Dreadful Future is because that's how she views where I'm going, basically. Sure, sure. And uh, split. split, it's called Split, is the one where, yeah, where That's I'm the one. talking, uh, where I recorded all the conversations, all the, all the things that she says to me when she's not happy with me. Uh, so, yeah, we'll probably <laughs> that's the very one. We'll go okay. with that for, for Song of the Day. I found it. It was... Um... You know, obviously it might might not be your taste in music, but it might be. I think it's about two minutes long. Give it a listen. Um, perhaps get it get inside the head of of the uh, the experiences of No Tricks. Um, if you have enjoyed this episode, make sure to like, subscribe, follow, share, do all the buttony things, and and make sure to rate as well, please. If you if you are on Spotify, Apple, Google, all of that stuff. Really, really helps out me a uh, bunch. It is pretty much the the lifeblood of a, a small independent creator. Um, as much sharing, as much following, as much rating as you can do will will always help me get these messages, get these stories like uh, like No Tricks out to the world, so that people can have better awareness of different neurodiversities and how um, people may experience life. So. If you want to stay up to date with the stuff that I do, I do a daily Instagram blog. Um, very active over on there. I do daily reels um, and also little sort of soundbite shorts um, of the podcast episodes over on there. And you can find that at Thomas Henley UK. 
Uh, if you want to get in contact for public speaking events, you want to book me for them, uh, you want to book me for some modeling, uh, perhaps you want to book me for some autism coaching, uh, go over to my website. The autism coaching is still in the um, the works. It's I'm hoping that it's going to be sometime around April, but there has been some events that have happened recently which may have to push that back. But if you get in touch, send me an email. Um, I can add you to the list and, and get back in touch. Uh, once the service is live <laughs> crazy um but thank you for 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 listening thank you for watching um no tricks how, how are you feeling <laughs> are you okay <laughs> i'm really good i think we did a brilliant job here of raising definitely. awareness and explaining the case of deity brilliant well, it's been really lovely to chat and uh, thank you very much for tuning in to this week's 40 Orty podcast episode. And I very much, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. See you later, guys. <laughs>